Welcome to Develop A-Level Teaching. DAT is a programme run by Hounslow Education Partnership focused on delivering CPD that furthers the educational outcomes of sixth form pupils across the borough. My name is Claire and I'm the Deputy Head Teacher at Breach Academy Felton. I'm also an A-Level Chemistry teacher and I'm really excited to be delivering this keynote today. The theme for DAT this year is about introducing new knowledge. Today, we are going to think about how we plan to introduce new knowledge to pupils using principles from educational research. I'm going to start by recapping the modal model of learning, then I'll give three steps to consider in planning, and then you'll have an opportunity in your subject groups to discuss how this applies to your subject. This is a really great opportunity to talk to other subject experts about the nuances of explanations in your subject and collaborate to design a sophisticated mental model about what success looks like when introducing new topics. We're going to start by reviewing the modal model of learning. This is a really useful explanation of how pupils learn, and you've probably seen it before. But if we're going to make decisions about how we teach pupils, it's really useful to have a basis in educational research for why we're making those decisions. The modal model is useful because Willingham has taken lots of cognitive science and identified what is common across all of those models of learning. That means that we can be confident that when we're basing our decisions on this model, it is most likely that they are going to impact learning. The first part of Willingham's model is about the environment. In the environment, there are lots of things that pupils can pay attention to, and only the ones that pupils tend to enter into their working memory. The working memory is finite, which means only a small amount of information can be used at any one time. This is where we talk about the idea of cognitive overload. If we're trying to hold too much information in our head, we won't be able to fit that in our working memory. In order to support our working memory, we want to encode information into our long-term memory. The great thing about long-term memory is that it is essentially infinite. We can store as much information in our long-term memory as we like, whereas our working memory can only store a certain number of facts at any one time. The way information is stored in our long-term memory is in the form of schema. Schema is sort of like a web of knowledge of everything that we know and how it relates to everything else. The more sophisticated our schema, the more expert that we are. And in fact, experts have not only have more knowledge, but they have more connections between that knowledge, which means they're able to use their knowledge more flexibly. When we are thinking about our A-level students, we want them to have sophisticated schemas similar to experts, because we want them to be able to use the knowledge that we have given them flexibly to answer any question in an exam. The way that we um, use our information in long-term memory is that we need to retrieve it back into our working memory. And that's why things like um, retrieval practice is a really important part of the learning process. At any point from our working memory or our long-term memory, we could forget things. The, first, uh, the second part of this model is really important. This is the encoding part, and this is the part that we are going to focus on today. The better information is encoded into our long-term memory, the easier it is to retrieve that information. That is because it is placed in our schema in a way that is related to things that we already know. So rather than being an isolated new piece of information, this new piece of information is connected to our existing schema, making it easier to retrieve. In order to encode things effectively into our long-term memory, we need to do three things. 
The first thing we need to do is we need to activate prior knowledge. In order to link our new piece of information to our existing schema, we need to recall information that we already know and make an explicit link to the new information. That allows us to see how the new information links to our existing schema and explicitly creates these links within our understanding. The second thing we need to do is we need to break down the new concept into small parts. When we are teaching new information, our aim is to get information from our working memory into our long-term memory. If we introduce too much information at once, we will overload our working memory and then we are likely to forget. If we can break new information into small parts, we protect the space in the working memory, making it more likely that new information will be encoded. The third thing we need to do is that we need to check for understanding. It's really important that the information that we encode in our long-term memory is correct. There is a possibility that pupils will encode incorrect mis uh, misconceptions in their working memory. We need to plan our questioning for after introduction of new information to check that pupils have understood what we have taught and that they have encoded the correct information into their long-term memory. Here's an example of how small step instruction could be used to teach the tricky concept of uh, muscle contraction in A-level biology. So I would always start with making sure the students know which part of the spec we are referring to. At Heston, we have a flipped learning model with our post 16. Um, so the students would always be given what's called an A01 is for me task, where they look at the content in advance prior to coming to the lesson. I would usually start with a video just to provide that imagery so the concept is less um, abstract. I would next give the students um, a broken down, very concise, clear explanation. And then as I explain, I tend to use a lot of hand-drawn diagrams on the whiteboard. They can just read and follow rather than worrying about writing anything down. Once I've repeated the explanation a few times, they would then memorize it themselves and then verbally explain it to a partner. Um, whilst I would then circulate and listen to their answers and address any misconceptions. Um, it's always good to have a challenge question on the board as well for those students that um, tend to be faster. In this particular example with muscle contraction, um, I've gone for a two-step explanation. So initially just talk about the mechanism and then afterwards talking about the role of energy and ATP. So I'd then extend that explanation. This section is particularly complicated. So I would use um, at least two or three different ways of explaining different diagrams to help them understand. We would now repeat the verbal task again, but rather than just doing the first nine points, they have to go all the way through and do all 16 um, points of the explanation, and I get a chance to circulate once more. Um, I would normally mix up the groups again so that working with different partners. It's useful to then play the original video again uh, so that students can see how much that their understanding has progressed. A quick return to the challenge question. In A-level biology, there's an essay where students are expected to go beyond the specification. So building that bank of interesting stories is always a good use of time. So next, a chance for the students to apply their understanding to a real exam question. 
Uh, I would always pick one that is very much just AO1, purely recall initially. I would then try and circulate and mark as many of the students myself as I can live in the lesson, but we would also go through the mark scheme and where lots of students have missed similar marks, um, re-explain as required. So next, either within the lesson or perhaps as a homework, they would be set more examination questions to practice uh, and then they would bring those back to the lesson with any queries that they might have and then we can model those and go through to address any problems. Um, we would also do that verbal task again in the next um, lesson and then repeat it multiple times throughout the year. So that is just a brief example of how you can take a concept and really break down the learning into smaller chunks, giving students lots of opportunities to practice while you do AFL and listen to address any misconceptions. Uh, and then um, again, breaking down how you would approach the exam questions with an AO1 focus initially, and then moving on to the more application questions, making sure that you're modeling how to answer those questions as well. The next stage of the DAT programme is to meet as a subject group. The DAT subject groups are split into three parts. First, there is a discussion based on the keynote. Then there is some time for group planning around these ideas. And then there is time to outline actions moving forward. We know that the success of the DAT CPD model is dependent on the quality of these discussions. I encourage you to prepare for this by completing two short tasks. The first task to prepare for the discussion on the keynote, we would like you to think about three initial questions. My recommendation would be to briefly pause the video to write down your initial reflections. The first question is how does your everyday planning with Key Stage 5 reflect what you know about the modal model of memory? The second question is what do you already do in the classroom to break concepts down into small parts? And the third question is what challenges do you face when it comes to complex new concepts? To prepare for the group planning task, we would like you to bring a topic to discuss with a small group. Together, you cho will choose a topic to focus on and identify how to activate prior knowledge, break down information into small parts and check for understanding. This is your opportunity to plan with other subject experts how you will break down an upcoming unit. You'll be able to draw on the experience of others in the group, adapt and develop the way that you already teach this concept. A fresh perspective is an opportunity to rethink and refine your explanation, even if you've been teaching for years. It is not the content, but the process that we want to consider at the heart of this discussion. Thank you for the time that you have dedicated to preparing for your subject group. I really hope you have a productive discussion and that this session is useful in developing your A-level teaching. <laughs>